So please bear with me. I'm getting over cold here. Um, but I am thrilled to be here at PyDX, um, and I am excited to be giving the second iteration of this talk, uh, something that I that really means a lot to me. Uh, so just stepping back a bit, I'm uh, Josh Simmons. I'm a program manager at the Google Open Source Programs Office. I'm a director at the Open Source Initiative, um, self-taught web developer um, who's run guilds and clubs and Boy Scout you know, all manner of things. I've done community for a lot longer than I've done technology. Um, and so in the process, I've learned a lot about how groups of people evolve and the roles that both leadership and community members have to play in shaping communities. So today what I'm sharing is some of what I've learned. Um, and my goal with this talk is to shine a light on things that all of us can do to make the communities we belong to more awesome. My hope is that through this talk, uh, you might take some notes for yourself about specific things that I've talked about that you might want to do to make your community more excellent um, or specific individuals that you can talk to to get more ideas. So a little housekeeping to start. Um, <clears throat> I've worn a lot of hats and I still wear quite a few. Um, right now I'm wearing the hat of the individual Joshua Simmons, community builder, uh, open source advocate, etc. Nothing I say represents my current, former, future employers. Um, and with that said, I should say my slides will not be available. Don't worry, you're not really missing out. It's just a list with pretty pictures. Um, I'll be around the conference, happy to take questions, easy enough to find online. Um, yeah, so without further ado, um, let's talk a little about why I'm talking about community. Open source is nothing if not community. But far too often, this aspect of our uh, projects and meetups is left to chance. Um, these days, we're seeing benevolent dictators for life, community managers, and other leaders taking a more proactive role in setting a healthy tone uh, to build a, a good, productive culture for their communities. But while community leaders set the tone, um, the evolution of community and culture uh, happens from the bottom up as much as it happens from the top down. And so to that end, th that's why we're exploring what, what I can do, what you can do, um, to make the communities that we belong to better. And there are a lot of things we can do. There are really large things that we can do, of course. Those are usually things that come to mind most often. There are small things we can do. There are things we can do proactively and, and reactively, just passively. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about are nine different things that we can, we can explore doing. Um, again, please. My goal is for you to walk away with one or two specific things that you will follow up on. Um, some things that are small enough and easy enough that you can do them today. Okay. Uh, first, make sure your docs are excellent. Now, yes, when we talk about docs, we're usually thinking about open source projects, but there's documentation for communities as well, right? What can you expect when you attend a certain meetup? What can you expect when you attend a conference? Uh, for people who haven't been to many meetups or conferences, they're black boxes and they don't know what the experience is going to be like. Um, when we're talking about projects, people can't contribute to a project, let alone use it, if the documentation isn't spot on. Is the documentation accurate? Uh, is it up to date? Is it even complete? At SpinachCon, project contributors watch as new entrants try to use their software for the first time. And it's often a really painful experience um, because you'll find all of the little assumptions in the documentation that aren't spelled out. And this is a really great way to, uh, to improve your documentation. Uh, what you can do is sanity check your documentation. Try to find new contributors, um, people who even just want to use the code, right? So this isn't just about can people uh, use the code, it's can they contribute to the code, can a developer contribute to the code, can a designer contribute to the project, right? So there are a lot of different aspects of documentation to consider. Uh, does your documentation assume a technical background? You know, we have an industry that's just loaded with jargon and loaded with assumptions. I'm fairly new to the Python world, and I've been grateful that a lot of the projects have excellent docs. They don't really assume a whole lot, and often it's very easy for me to find um, you know, a glossary or explanation of the terms in there. 
But there are a lot of projects that still assume quite a lot. Um, if a designer can't read your documentation and become a contributor, then there's a gap. There's something to be fixed. Um, so consider adding, adding a glossary of uncommon words or phrases to your project, uh, to your documentation. And beyond that, beyond just looking at the assumptions and the technical language that are there, think about the rest of the world. Only 5.5% of the world population speaks English fluently and natively. Um, by having documentation that is perhaps using words or sentence structures that are unwieldy, um, we are erecting artificial barriers to using our projects. So there's something known as universal English. Universal English is a, uh, a type of, of English that is you know, written for people who are non-native speakers uh, and, and everybody else who can understand it really well. So consider if your documentation is written in universal English. And if possible, if you're part of a project that has enough users or enough contributors uh, to explore translations, all the better. You know, localizing that documentation is a great way to go. Uh, of course, that requires maintenance, so that's, that's an option only so many projects can explore. There are a lot of examples of quality documentation we can learn from. Uh, here at a Python conference, I think we've seen a lot of, a lot of people here have probably seen a lot of that already. Django is, exempl is exemplary. Um, Drupal also has great documentation, and it uses the concept of personas, people with certain identities or backgrounds, um, and they can find the documentation that speaks to them directly. So moving on, um, share your knowledge and your story. We all live in some sort of bubble. Um, we may assume that everyone knows about our project or certain aspects of the technologies we're working with, um, or that the problems we've learned to solve are trivial and no longer worth sharing the solutions to. But raising awareness about a project, the, the work of doing that never ends. Um, and there are always new people joining the community. So even though it may be a simple problem that you've solved, it's probably still worth blogging about that. It's probably still worth giving a presentation about that at a meetup or a conference. There's always a need for beginner material. So blog about the challenges you face, the, ch the solutions you discover. Tweet about your blog post, tweet about industry news. You know, one thing about this industry is it moves really freaking fast. And so one of the best ways we learn is by having quality information sort of filtered uh, percolated up to us through our networks. So be part of that network. Be part of uh, the solution to solving this information overload and trying to keep up with everything. Um, so blog, tweet, and yes, present at meetups and conferences. You know, finding meetups is really easy. Portland has a ton of them. Um, I'm not assuming everyone here is from Portland, though. Plug in your zip code, your postal code. There's probably more meetups in your area than you'd expect. Um, you know, ask the organizer if they're looking for speakers. They probably are. Um, now, speaking at conferences isn't quite as easy. Um, it's not that the act of speaking is more challenging. It's that you have to go through uh, a call for proposals process, and there's a review process through which uh, proposals are selected. Uh, but there are a lot of guides out there about how to craft proposals that a conference will accept. Um, there are a lot of speakers in the room who are probably willing to help you with those things. Um, often, a conference will run something called office hours, during which you can uh, go into IRC or tweet to them and say, like, hey, I'm looking for ideas, or this is my idea, um, can you help me flesh it out? Um, or they'll just even review the proposal you put together and help hone that. Another way to find conferences is uh, the CFP reports, uh, or lanyard.com, great index of events. My, one of my favorite ways to find quality events um, is at Callback Women on Twitter. It's an index of over 3,000 conferences, I believe, um, and they tweet about the CFPs as they're open. And Callback Women is run by Karina Zona, amazing person um, who also really cares that the events are welcoming events. So she's not going to be tweeting about something that's like sketchy. Um, so Callback Women, another great resource. Now, if you're not an experienced speaker or writer, um, that's not a problem. You know, we all start somewhere. Um, and there, again, are probably people in the room who are willing to help you. Uh, the point here is that we can't grow our communities if we aren't 
actively evangelizing about our communities if we're not actively extending a welcoming hand to newcomers. Uh, so before I move on, I just want to ask, who here in the room has experienced writing or presenting that would be willing to help other people get into that? Okay, look around the room. If you're interested at all, look, there are a ton of resources. Uh, people are amazing. They're willing to help. Um, don't be intimidated by speaking. Number three, build bridges with other communities. What's the best way to make sure you and your community reinvent the wheel? Is by being an island. If you're not talking to other people in other communities, then you're not going to be aware of the solutions they've come up for, for problems that you may be having. If you're not sharing the, your solutions across communities, well, you're going to be duplicating work um, that, that may be needless. So the idea here is that if we are only participating in the web development community, or if we are only participating in the Python community, then there are lost opportunities. Right? There might, there's an opportunity to be had, uh, there's value to be had in participating in Ruby conferences, or PHP conferences, or Drupal, or, or whatever it is. We should be speaking with the world at large. Um, and that's not just specific to technology. There are often design meetups, or UX meetups, that we can learn from. You know, development, building software, building websites is a really multi interdisciplinary pro uh, act. And so we should be exposing ourselves to people who are doing the other things that are necessary to get this done. We can always learn from each other. So go to the other, other uh, events. Um, follow an interesting smattering of people on Twitter, right? Don't build yourself an echo chamber of other Python developers. Find people who uh, develop in other languages, do other things for open source or just aren't like you in other ways. You know, that's a lot, a lot more educational than following the people who are more or less like you. Um, and lastly, try attending generalist conferences. Right? There are a lot of conferences like uh, Linux Fest Northwest. Yes, Linux isn't the title, but it's not about Linux. It's about technology. And so you find a nice cross-section of people working on different things uh, that you can learn from. So building bridges allows us to solve problems faster and learn from each other's mistakes. Uh, definitely explore other events and people that you can be talking to. Number four, mentor new contributors. Contributing to open source is intimidating. I will never forget the first contribution I made to the Drupal, uh, the Drupal project. It was strenuous. I mean, all I was writing was a simple, a simple abstraction um, that mapped one thing to another thing. But there was a lot about code style. There was a lot about how the, uh, the code was structured, how the files were structured. Um, and I had to get that right. Um, and then, of course, there was a review process and recruiting people to help review your code. Contributing is intimidating. So the more that we can do to make it less intimidating for people to hold their hand for the, through that first contribution, those first three contributions, to make sure that they're able to get uh, their contribution successfully merged into the code base, um, the better. And many of us, many of us deal with imposter syndrome. Um, a lot of people don't know that they actually have value that they can contribute to these projects. You know, there's an assumption that, oh, I need to have a certain skill level, or, you know, I, I'm not as talented, I think, as, as these other people, and so I think I'll just leave it to them. And it's also just embarrassing sometimes. You know, I have written code that I'm afraid to share because it, I think it's, it's architecturally ridiculous or, you know, I don't want people to see it. Um, but we don't learn from hiding those things. Um, so the more we can do to reach out to people who are interested in contributing um, or just encourage people to contribute and say that you're there to help them, the better. Um, because the barriers, even if, if a project has a quality contributor experience, the barrier is just emotionally to contributing uh, or even to having the connections necessary to contribute are pretty high. So make some time to help a person through the process of contributing. If you see someone at a meetup or a conference that looks confused, talk to them. Ask them if they're new. Ask them if they're looking uh, for any information in particular. Um, and if you want to get really serious about mentoring, there are a lot of opportunities to do this out there. There are organizations and programs like Linux Chicks, um, Outreachy, Rails Summer of Girls Summer of Code, Google Summer of Code, which provide endless opportunities for mentorship. And 
And um, Python, WordPress, Drupal, all of these uh, language communities host sprints alongside the main events. And those are also a great opportunity to mentor somebody. OK, so let's face it. Um, the design and usability of a lot of open source projects sucks. Like, that's a known issue, right? Um, there are very few standout projects in that way. Often the documentation does too. Now, wh why is this? Um, I submit that there are a few issues here. Um, I submit that the major reason is that we don't value, or put it another way, we value technical contributors over all others, right? Where's the code or shut up, right? Like, let me see the code. And, and, and it's not just that we demand working things uh, in order to even have a discussion. It's also that technical contributors are recognized in ways that others are not. Right, there's the GitHub contribution graph. Um, often there's a contributor's file with, an, with the name or alias of everybody who's contributed a line of code to that project. Okay, well, what about the community organizers? What about the moderators? What about the designers? What about the user experience designers? Um, what about the documenters, the, the technical writers? We need all of these people to craft quality software. The fact is that open source may have one on the back end in terms of building software and tooling, um, but it's never going to win on the front end. You know, we're never going to see the year of the Linux desktop if we don't care about user experience, if we don't have our projects really excel in that way. Um, so what does it mean to embrace all of the contributors to improve our projects? How, how can we do this? Um, a few suggestions. We can acknowledge our strengths and our weaknesses and rely on other people to use theirs. We can recognize that design, documentation, branding, and even marketing matter. Um, and while we may have opinions on them, if that's not our professional background, we should probably defer to the people who are experts there, right? We can focus on what we're good at. We can let them uh, do what they're good at. Identify where your project needs these skills, right? If, um, if you recognize that maybe your project doesn't have the best design, or maybe you don't even know where your project doesn't stand up, you know, invite people from these other communities to take a look at it and, and give their candid feedback. Right? They might find all manner of issues that we wouldn't see in our own project. And then when we've spot, spotted the issues, we can talk about, okay, well, how do we address these things? How do we make them better? Um, critically, we need to do outreach to these groups. You know, when I go to an open source conference, a generalist conference, it is developers wall to wall. Yes, I'm seeing more and more people who write documentation, which is excellent. I'm still not seeing many designers. Um, I'm seeing more and more community organizers, but we're still off in the wings and often, let me tell you, as someone with a background in marketing and community management, people are often like just, you know, very skeptical of me. But the reality is, is that we all bring new skills to the table that are necessary for open source projects to succeed. So do outreach to these communities and explicitly invite people to join us. Um, and make sure that these people are being recognized in our projects. If they're not being celebrated in person or in the contributor's file, that's a, that's a problem we can solve. Number six, champion inclusion. Um, I think, in general, with PyDX here, done an amazing job on this front, and I think, I, I hope, that I'm preaching to the choir. Um, but the bottom line is that com inclusive communities provide a diversity of perspectives. If our projects have input from more different people, then they will be able to solve problems for more different people. Um, despite the obvious value of diversity, though, it's troubling how homogenous <laughs> most communities are. Whether we're looking at age, geography, language, you know, uh, gender, any of these things up here. So what can we do? Yes, we should strive to learn about all of the dimensions of diversity, some of which are non-obvious, um, and we should strive to be allies. But we should also pick a few dimensions of diversity to be champions of. So myself, um, I'm a queer person with mental health issues. So because of who I am, I champion 
uh, LGBT, LGBT plus issues. I champion neurodiverse people. But also, I'm a white man, so I've got some privilege points to spend, and I use that on supporting people who are women uh, uh, and other genders, uh, people with physical disabilities, and you're not speaking for them, but amplifying them and uh, offering to be a mentor and whatnot. So there are a lot of things you can do to champion diversity. Um, you know, once you have learned, once you continue learning about the different dimensions of it, um, once you've decided what you're gonna be a champion of, um, find people who are part of those underrepresented groups and amplify their signal. Um, whether that's retweeting them or encouraging them to submit to conferences uh, as presenters. Certainly do active outreach to groups like Trans Code, to Women Who Code, Blacks in Technology. Um, there are more and more groups like these popping up. And anytime we're running an event, anytime we are building a project, we should look specifically to those groups to try to find people who have different perspectives, uh, who might be interested in what we're doing and contributing to it. You know, harking back to the last slide, uh, one of the previous slides, be a mentor to someone who's not like you. Um, so a key nuance that's often missed by well-meaning well people um, who champion diversity, including yours truly, is that champion diversity, championing diversity does not mean speaking for underrepresented people. Um, it means making sure that they have a seat at the table uh, by building bridges, amplifying signals, and being a shoulder to stand on. And if you find yourself talking about these issues more than you're listening, I've done that, um, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, so unless you're speaking as a member of that underrepresented community, listen more than you talk, amplify signals, and be a mentor. Number seven, uh, organize a meetup. Mailing lists, IRC, Slack, uh, issue trackers, wikis, these are all great resources for communicating and collaborating around projects. Uh, but there's nothing like meeting in person. Of course, you know this because you're at a conference. Um, but you know, what if you don't even know the right words to ask a question? What if you aren't sure if a particular tool is right for you and their documentation doesn't speak to you? Um, what if you just need an excuse to get out of the home because you work from home most of the time? Right? We all need community. User groups and meetups are fantastic resources for uh, beginners and seasoned professionals alike. And not only do they serve as a way to exchange information, and we talked earlier about how difficult um, it is to keep up with the fast-moving industry, um, but they also provide community and they become part of an infrastructure that locals nurtures the local uh, industry. A meetup needn't be formal or even an ongoing thing, um, just pop up an event. Now, I am running slower than I thought I would, so I'm gonna to try to speed up a little bit. Not everybody is interested in starting a meetup, and it's not a trivial thing, to be perfectly honest. Um, but you can be a volunteer, right? So consider volunteering at local meetups or conferences. There are many, many ways to help, whether that's through AV, through speakers, through wrangling sponsorship, finding venues, um, buying the food and bringing it, you know, whatever it is, there's so many little ways that you can contribute to making a meetup happen. Um, are there any people here, or who, who here is like volunteering either at PyDX or at other meetups locally? Awesome, thank you all for doing that. Um, I think we should, you know, when we have any extra bandwidth, we should try to support the communities we're part of, and I think um, it's a really gratifying thing too. You know, whether you're just opening doors for people or being the greeter, um, there's a lot that you can learn from that experience. Okay. So this is a big one. Um, I put it last because it's a big deal. And it's one that I really, really want you to remember. Um, it's on the slide. I know you can read. But just to make it clear, our community is only as awesome as the worst behavior that we tolerate. So it's great that we're seeing widespread adoption of code of conducts, uh, codes of conduct, and yes, we have a lot of long way to go there too, and there are enforcement issues, uh, but a code of conduct does not change a culture on its own. It just sets a bit of a tone. We change culture through re-examining the decisions we make over an extended period of time, decisions big and small, such as positive decisions to explicitly support underrepresented people, or 
the decision to combat uh, toxic behaviors that drive people away from our communities. Now, I don't mean to suggest that this is a confrontational thing by using the word combat. Confrontation is scary and often the, and, and sometimes counterproductive, especially because many people don't realize when they're being a jerk. Well, speaking honestly for myself, um, I've been a jerk, I will be a jerk, but I continue to try to be less of a jerk. And we've all been there. We've all been there, and we all will go there. So how do we address this? You know, how do you consider how you would like someone to approach you if you were being the jerk? Uh, you know, be charitable and assume that no ill will is intended, but that only goes so far. Uh, bad behavior is often due to ignorance, and, and many people are willing to learn. So be empathetic when you can. Um, and know that it's rarely appropriate to call someone out in public. People will often dig their heels in. Um, it's often better to take them aside. And there are really official channels for dealing with these things. You know, PyDX made it really clear. There is a phone number. Um, there's probably an email address and other resources for going to when you have a code of conduct violation for report, reporting harassment and other problematic behavior. Um, this topic goes deep, and I'm certainly not going to be able to do it proper justice. But it's important, and we need to keep it in mind. Our communities are only as awesome as the worst behavior we tolerate. So I don't want to end on a crappy note, and no list talk is complete without a surprise list item, right? Um, so express your gratitude. This is one thing that we can do to make the communities we belong to way more awesome. You know, thank the people who are uh, contributors of different types, uh, volunteers of different types. Positive Python's uh, an amazing hashtag I learned at uh, Pi learned about at PyCon this year. Uh, let's all build a better hat rack is a great uh, movement, I guess, created by, uh, spurred by Leslie Hawthorne, uh, fanned on by Katie McLaughlin, who's got, uh, you know, Octo Hat Rat, might have been renamed, actually. Um, but there are great ways to express your, uh, express your gratitude. Happinesspackets.io is a great way to send somebody a little, like, shot of joy. Um, let's be thankful, because we're, work we're living in a community um, where a lot of people have volunteered their times to uh, enable the work that we do. I've run out of time, but um, eating my own dog food, there are a lot of people for me to be thankful, uh, thankful to. Um, and specifically, I want to thank uh, Victor Villa, who uh, took a bet on me and allowed me to give this as a keynote at his conference earlier this year. And I want to thank uh, Rachel, Georgia, Thursday, Heidi, Heidi and the Chris's, um, and all of the volunteers here who have made PyDX possible um, and who have allowed me the opportunity to come share, um, share this with you. So in closing, there are many ways to make our communities more awesome. You can help without spending much of your time uh, just by being more grateful. You can help others while helping yourself by giving presentations. It's really great for your career. Um, the bottom line is this. Cultural change happens from the bottom up as well as the top down. We should expect our leaders, our benevolent dictators, community managers to do better, yes. But we must also do better. So in the interest of doing better, Take ownership of the communities you belong to, and let's go forth and be excellent to each other. Thank you.